Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. It's good to see everyone. If you're able to and would like to, let's all stand together. If at any time during the music service you'd like to be seated, feel free to do so. It won't bother me one little bit. Sometimes I prefer to sit. <laughs> let's start off with that old song. We're going to do some uh, camp meeting style songs tonight. We'll do four of them. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. I was humbly kneeling, 
This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, I know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I Underneath 
Amen. All right. Thank you, Mark, for leading us in those songs. And uh, that was, I uh, felt like I was in Randolph, Mississippi. Those were Sunday regulars at our home church. And, and I enjoyed that. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, let me make a few announcements. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 11 once again tonight. Hebrews chapter number 11. Um, remember our 21 days of prayers were one week in, and uh, so far, uh, I hope you have prayed for Mark Thrift, David Cook, uh, Joseph and Mark Oberman, Edgar Figali, uh, James Adams, who by the way will be preaching for us on Sunday, um, Jeff Price, John Schrader, and then today I hope you've prayed for Jim Showers in Paraguay. So remember this, remember this, Jonathan Lott tomorrow. Uh, Ken Trivet um, on Friday, uh, Kent Gossmeyer in England on Saturday, and Luke Shelby uh, on Sunday. And so keep this, keep this, and uh, we'll pray through April the 2nd. Once we get into April, we've got a, uh, Brother Richard, Miss Luann, and I put together a, a nice calendar for you. Uh, has each day on it and a specific missions prayer request, not, not necessarily a specific missionary. Some days are, but but a specific missionary prayer, missions prayer request. And so we'll get that out here soon. But remember these, these requests in prayer. Again, tonight when you pray, remember Jim Showers in prayer. Um, as far as announcements, remember on Sunday, I just said it, but the Jimmy Adams, James Adams will be with us. Um, he'll be returning. I talked to him yesterday. He'll be returning from a mission trip uh, in Mexico. He says it's been tremendous. He looks forward to telling us all about it. And uh, he'll preach on Sunday. And then he will give an update on Sunday night, and we will observe the Lord's Supper in the evening service. And so come prepared for that. Uh, get asked on a regular basis, what do, you, do we do the Lord's Supper every month or every, every quarter or whatever? Well, the Bible doesn't really lay that out. The Bible says as often as you do it. Uh, it doesn't say you have to do it every quarter or every month or every other month. It just says as oft as you do it. And uh, so it's kind of sporadic, but we do it at least three or four times a year, if not if not a time or two more. And so uh, remember that Lord's Supper this, this Sunday night. Uh, on March the 30th, uh, Saturday, we're going to have a churchwide work day, spring cleaning. Um, and so please, if you can help us, please come and, and partake in that. Uh, plenty to do inside and out. Uh, men, if you come, uh, if you want to bring some uh, yard equipment, help out extra weed eaters, blowers, things like that, uh, we'll certainly put them put them to use. Uh, we'll have both of our zero turn lawnmowers in good working order, but there's more than just, just mowing and weeding that needs to be done. And uh, so we'll say more about that. But if you can make plans to be with us Saturday, 8 a.m., the more people that come, the less time it will take. And so if you can join us, we would appreciate that. Following day on March 31st, that Sunday, of course, is Easter. We'll start at 8 o'clock with uh, breakfast, donuts and kolaches, coffee, milk, juice, things like that, and, uh, and, then, and then worship will begin by 9 o'clock, and that's it for the day. No Sunday school, no evening services, just worship at 9. Once we finish, conclude worship, uh, shortly after we'll have an Easter egg hunt uh, for children, and so keep, keep that in mind as well. And then, of course, our missions conference, April 3rd through the 7th, please put those dates down and attend. And... Uh, this is our 53rd annual missions conference, and we're looking forward to hearing God's word from Ken Trivet on Wednesday and Thursday, uh, Mark Thrift on Friday and Sunday morning as well. And then we've got a, a number of missionaries coming um, as well. Uh, Brother Tim Jansen, church planner in Victoria, British Columbia, who I was with last June, is going to be here. Um, man by the name of Daniel Jones, Dr. Daniel Jones. He's a medical doctor by trade, and he is in medical missions with an organization called Operation Renewed Hope. will be with us as well. Uh, David Cook will be with us. Uh, our missionary sent out of our church uh, in Canada will be with us as well. And then uh, my good friend Jeff Taylor will be back with us. He's been here a time or two, and Jeff's going to come and give an update on the organization he started uh, that they call Come Before Winter, and uh, he'll give an update on that one evening. And so uh, we've got a couple missionaries that are brand new and then some that, some that we already support and are familiar with. But for many of you, they'll all be brand new, 
And, of course, Ken Trivich, just a tremendous, tremendous Bible teacher, preacher, expositor, um, one, of, one of my favorites, and I'm looking forward to that. Of course, Brother Mark, uh, uh, no one is better on missions than Mark Thrift, and so we'll look forward to hearing, hearing those guys preach and hearing good missionary presentations each evening and on Sunday as well. And then to conclude the conference, we'll take up a faith promise offering. And, uh, and so we'll be praying about that, how much the Lord would have you give above and beyond your tithe to world missions. And, uh, and, and so we're praying that the Lord would, would use what we give to further the gospel around the world. All right. Uh, if you can bring some gift cards uh, and help us out with that for, for gifts, the, the, uh, the drop box is in the foyer. And uh, Amazon, Visa, Walmart, things like that are very practical and it'd be a blessing to those those guests we have coming in. So if you can bring those, we'll certainly take them throughout the conference as well. And so help us out with that. All right, Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This has to be one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible. I know it's the greatest chapter on faith in the Bible. And as we have moved through the book of Hebrews... Um, for, for over a half a year now, uh, close to 40 weeks. As a matter of fact, I think we're in week 37 or 38, or message 37 or 38. But as we've moved through the book of Hebrews, we're, we're coming to uh, the concluding chapters. And, and really, um, I've done my best to keep the overall theme of the book of Hebrews before us each week. And of course, we know that the book has a, a twofold purpose. Number one, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to show his superiority. Uh, that's why the word better occurs uh, often in the book of Hebrews. And the second purpose is to encourage us as believers to, to go on to, to maturity, uh, to, to completion, if you will, in the Lord, to, to not be satisfied with status quo, to not be satisfied to just be ordinary, uh, complacent, but to become extraordinary in our walk with the Lord and in our faith. Uh, we've said that in Christ we have a better person, the person of Jesus Christ. In Christ we have a better priest. Jesus is not, uh, he is not just our priest on earth, but he's our priest in heaven. Uh, in Christ we have a better provision, that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ uh, to make atonement for our sins and, uh, and then we've entered into chapter 11, and we've learned that in chapter 11, we live the Christian life by a better principle, and that is uh, the principle of faith. And that's why when you study Hebrews chapter 11, you'll find uh, there is a phrase that, that is pretty constant that recurs through, and it's that phrase, by faith, by faith, by faith. And yet, tonight in our study, we'll begin in verse 28, it kind of changes, and it says, through faith, uh, through faith. Um, when you receive Christ as your personal Savior, you, you live your life on a different principle, a different basis, and that is um, faith. It's a different approach to life. Of course, we know Paul said, I think, to the church at Corinth, um, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, I believe it is, uh, put it very clearly. He said, we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, two ways you can live your life. You can live your life on the basis of those things that your, your eyes can see, or you can live uh, on, on faith, by faith, and live on the basis of those things that, that you can't necessarily see, but trusting that God can see them. It's a new principle. It's a new way to live. 1 John 5, 4 says, This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And so faith is a big deal in our life. Uh, we cope with problems, we encounter and overcome difficulties, uh, we fight the battles of life um, by faith, on the basis of faith. This is the great faith chapter. Now, I've given you a definition of what faith is. Let me, let me re repeat it for you. you. I want you to memorize it. I want, I, want you, um, I want it to burn in your heart. And that is, faith is trusting God. And God's word and, and what God says and acting upon that regardless of circumstances and regardless of consequences. Faith is trusting what God says, trusting his word and acting upon it regardless of circumstances and regardless of consequences. And certainly we have seen that definition played out in the lives of individuals through this chapter. 
We walk by faith, not by sight. God has given us His Word, and His Word is the mechanism of faith. It's, and uh, it's the principle of faith that brings the things of God and brings the power of God into our lives and makes, makes it real. It's kind of like uh, one commentator used this illustration. He said faith is kind of like a light switch. You, you go into a room and it's, it's dark. You can't see uh, you can't see anything in front of you. You can't see your hand in front, of, in front of your face. It's dark. You need some light. All the equipment's in place. Um, the lights are there. The bulbs are there. The sockets are there. The, the lines are run correctly. The juice is available in the lines. And, and, uh, then, but you have to go to a wall. And on a wall somewhere, there's a little contraption that we call a switch. And you flip it up. And when you flip the switch, the light comes on. And the power uh, that brings light into the room uh, is activated by that switch. Faith is the switch that turns on the power of God. Faith is the, is the switch in our life that brings the promises of God to us uh, with power. And that's what we've been talking about in Hebrews chapter number 11. And really Hebrews chapter 11 is a pretty good survey of the Old Testament. Uh, we started in the book of Genesis. And uh, the, the writer of Hebrews has given us multiple individuals. He's now moved through the book of Genesis, and now he's gone into the Exodus, and he's taken up the life of Moses as an example of a life of faith. Now notice what the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 28. The Bible says, through faith, he, that's Moses, uh, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn, that's Pharaoh, should touch them. Now, my Bible, I have the word he, through faith he, underlined, and I've got the word them underlined. This verse has moved from an individual, he, Moses, to a them, to a group of people, children of Israel. And he's going to talk about how faith works and how faith operates and what it does in the life of an individual, but not only in the life of an individual, but he's going to illustrate it and how it can affect the life of a group. In this instance, the life of a nation, the nation of Israel. The Old Testament is the history of the nation of Israel. Now, why in the world uh, should you and I bother studying a group of people who lived a long, long time ago. Well, they were God's chosen people. They were God's chosen people, and in the life and history of the children of Israel, God illustrates for you and I what faith really is and what it's all about. As a matter of fact, in verse 28, verse 29, and verse 30, he reaches into the history of the children of Israel, and he pulls out three illustrations, three, uh, three um, uh, situations that they went in, went through, and he's going to explain to us what faith uh, does. Now, I want you to notice these three illustrations. In verse 28, he gives us the event of the Passover. That's recorded for us in Exodus chapter 12. We, I won't spend a lot of time there. We were, if you were here on Sunday morning, uh, I gave a, a full sermon on it. Uh, in verse 29, he gives us the event of the miraculous parting of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel uh, walking through on dry ground. That's the second uh, illustration. But then in verse 30, uh, he gives us the event of the Battle of Jericho. And each one of these illustrates a, a, a really uh, a characteristic of faith or something that faith brings into our life does for us. They're, they're Old Testament pictures of New Testament truth, New Testament faith. Let's get into it. Notice in verse 28, through faith, he, Moses, kept the Passover. Here's the first thing that faith will do for you. It will bring you out. It will bring you out. Here's what I mean by that. You learn in the Passover experience that faith brings us out. And to see this, you've got to turn, hold your spot in Hebrews 11, uh, put a bookmark there, but go to Exodus chapter number 12. Go to Exodus chapter number 12. If you don't have a fancy Bible like, like me with three bookmarkers, you need to buy one, or if you've got a gum wrapper or something like that, it's a good bookmarker. Growing up, my daddy, my daddy chewed a lot of gum, and, and 
And if he was in church, he'd tell my mom, don't throw that wrapper away. I'll use that. And he'd put gum wrappers all in his Bible. <laughs> Exodus chapter number 12. You have the biblical record of the Passover. Now, again, we dealt with this a lot more thoroughly on Sunday morning. Um, but you, you know the circumstances of the Passover. God's getting, God's getting ready to lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt uh, into the land of Canaan, the land of promise, and the land of victory. And he's going to use this man by the name of Moses. Moses had gone to Pharaoh and, and said, Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh said, uh, yeah, yeah, right, and it ain't happening, not by the hair on my chinny-chin-chin. And... Uh, Seeing if you're awake, that was not Pharaoh. That was the big bad wolf that said that, but uh, pretty close there. Pharaoh refused to do it. So God sent a series of plagues, 10 of them, and when you get to chapter number 12, nine have already been completed. They, they've already went down. The 10th is going to be the death of the firstborn in Egypt, but God's going to make provision for the children of Israel and this event that, that is called the Passover. Now, really, the Passover was a meal. It's a special meal, very important one. It was a meal that involved the children of Israel and how they were to participate together um, in the, the, the killing of a spotless lamb, the shedding of that blood, the sprinkling of the blood of that lamb. We'll talk about that in a moment. And really, it's just an Old, Te Old Testament picture of what Christ did for us at Calvary. Now, we like to sing songs about the blood, don't we? The blood of Jesus Christ. There, there is power, power, power in the blood. I love songs about the blood of Christ. It's precious. They're precious uh, for us to sing and to think about the blood of Christ because it was at Calvary where, where God paid the price for our sins and he did it by the shed blood of, uh, of his son Jesus Christ. That's why those songs are special. One of my favorite says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that song, of course, gets its idea, its theme from Exodus chapter 12. Notice in verse 13, you'll find identical words. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And so God has made a provision so that the firstborn of the families of the children of Israel would not be destroyed by the death angel. But when the death angel passed over, if the death angel saw the, the blood applied to the, to the door of that house, he would pass over, they would be spared. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into all that this evening, but there are two truths that emerge out of the Passover that are really, really important for you to understand in terms of, of our salvation. Uh, the first one is this, is that blood has to be shed. It had to be shed. Notice in verse 3 of Exodus 12 what the Lord says to do. He says that they are to take a lamb. He says, every man a lamb. Verse 4 it says, you know, if the household be too little, and notice this, for the lamb. So verse 3 said a lamb. Verse 4, the lamb. Notice in verse 5. Your lamb. You see that progress there? It's interesting to me. It starts off with a lamb. It moves to the lamb. Then it says your lamb. God says there's got to be a substitute lamb. Of course, we know the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so not only were the people of Egypt under a real death threat, but so are all of us by virtue of being in the human family. We're under a death threat. The wages of sin... Is death. What you deserve, what I deserve because of sin is death. And so we're in bad trouble if there is no substitute. But thank God there's a substitute. God says in the Old Testament, here's the substitute. It's a lamb, a lamb, the lamb, your lamb. But not only that, but the lamb had to be spotless. Verse 5, your lamb should be without blemish. And so they would, they would inspect this lamb very thoroughly. And make sure that there were no flaws in this lamb. Couldn't have a broken leg. He couldn't have a, a cut on him or a scar or, or, or discoloration or anything. Had to be perfect. Had to be spotless. Well, when Jesus came, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. One of my favorite verses in all of the Bibles, 1 Peter 1.18, the Bible says we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb without spot, without blemish. Christ is that Lamb. He was the spotless lamb. Christ could not die a death that would be satisfactory to pay for our sin debt if he had sins of his own that he had to pay for. If Christ had been a sinner, the only debt that he could pay for is, it would be his sin. 
Thank God he was not a sinner. He was without sin, and, and he could die on the cross for you and for me, for your sins, for my sins, the sins of the world, because he was God's spotless, special, perfect lamb. And notice at the end of verse 6, so let's read the whole thing. It says, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So not only was it a substitute lamb, but it was slaughtered. It was a slaughtered lamb. They would, they would take that little lamb, and in the twilight, in the evening, they would kill it, and blood would be shed. Earlier in the book of Hebrews, this writer in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, said that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sins. There had to be the shedding of blood. But then notice something else. Not only did there have to be the shedding of blood, but in verse 7, it says, and they shall take of the blood, in other words, that they would take that blood in the lamb, that blood of the lamb that had been killed, and you can learn in other places in the Bible that, they, that the blood would be put in a bowl, uh, a basin. Verse 22 gives us a little fuller statement of what they would do, and it says, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop. Now, hyssop was a, a little uh, bush, uh, and it would grow in the cracks and the crevices of, of the walls around the city and in the homes and the the, wall, the cracks of the homes around the city. And, and, and hyssop was a very thick, a very full type uh, of a plant. And it, it was a good applicator. It was like a paintbrush. And you could stick that hyssop down into that, that bowl of blood. And uh, it would absorb the blood, and then it would become an applicator. Notice in verse 7, They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And so... And so he says, uh, then he says, none of you go out of the house until the morning. Notice verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And so it wasn't enough for the blood to just be shed. Uh, the blood literally had to be sprinkled, if you will, over the door. It had to be applied. It had to be applied. There has to be the shedding of the blood. Jesus had to shed his blood on Calvary's cross. And, and by the way, there's a song in our hymn book. I don't want to be nitpicky tonight. I, I, it's a great song. But I don't, and I don't want to be nitpicky, but I'm going to be. Um, there's a song in our hymn book, and there's a line in it. And when we get to it, I refuse to sing it. I refuse to sing it. It says, where the blood of the lamb was spilt. I don't like that. I don't, the blood of the lamb was not spilt. was not spilt. Um, if I spill this water, that, that would be an accident. I would not spill this water on purpose, intentionally. It, it, it would be done accidentally. Well, Jesus didn't spill his blood on Calvary. It was no accident on Calvary's cross that his blood was shed. It was poured out. He gave his life's blood on Calvary's cross. 1 Peter 1, 2 says, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, and so not only did the blood of Jesus have to be shed on Calvary's cross, but personally and individually, the blood of Jesus Christ has to be applied to our hearts. When we're saved, if we're going to be saved, Pastor, explain that I can't. I cannot explain that to you. I cannot give you all the reasons why that's true. But I can simply say to you that, that in some uh, magical, marvelous way, when you come to that point where you realize you're a sinner and you understand and believe that Jesus died on the cross and he shed his precious blood on the cross of Calvary for you and your sins, and you come to him in faith and, and, and repentance of sins. And by faith you receive Christ in some, some marvelous, mysterious way. The blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our lives and the death angel passes over us. We are covered by the blood of Christ and we will never die and go to a devil's hell. We'll go to heaven because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. I wonder tonight, are you under the blood? Has the blood been applied to the, to the door of your heart 
Friend, if, if I were you and I had never received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I would not walk out of this building tonight until I knew that I was under the blood, that the blood of Jesus Christ had been applied to my heart for my soul's salvation. By faith, they passed. They, he, they, they kept the Passover. Faith brings us out. That's Calvary. And they were to eat that Passover meal. I find this interesting. I'll say it and move on. But they were to eat that Passover meal standing up with their shoes on, with their waist girded, bound up, as if they're ready to walk out the door, ready for the journey ahead. Here's what it meant. It meant that, that destruction had been averted, that they would not die, that they would reach their destination uh, uh, securely, that they were bound for the promised land. Friend, if, if you're saved tonight, you're under the blood, the death angel has passed over, you're not going to be judged for your sins, and you're on your journey to, to the promised land. As we sang tonight, this, this world is not my home. We're just passing through. Faith brings us out. That is hallelujah ground right there. Um, but then secondly, faith brings us through. Let's talk about that experience with the Red Sea. Uh, go to Exodus 14. Exodus 14. Now, in, in Hebrews eleven twenty nine, 29, you don't have to, to go back. I'll read it. It kind of gives a little commentary on it. It says, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, are saying to do, were drowned. Now, now here's what happened. You know the story. Uh, the Pharaoh, finally after, after that tenth plague, said to Moses, he said, Get out of here. Get out of here. We've had enough. And so Moses and the children of Israel did just that. Well, then Pharaoh had some second thoughts. He started second-guessing his decision to let them go. He realized he had just released all of his slave labor. And so, and so he gets his chariots and his men, and they head off uh, to, to go after the children of Israel. Well, the children of Israel got to the Red Sea. In front of them is a pretty big body of water. Behind them is the strongest army in the world at that time. It's what you call being between a rock and a hard place. Uh, they're in a really, really tight spot. They're in what seemed to be a very impossible situation, a no-win situation. You ever been in one of those? You ever been in a situation where you, you thought, boy, this is not going to be good. This is an impossible situation. Somebody sitting right here tonight in this building, I'm sure you say, that's me. That's me. You look ahead, you see the waters of the Red Sea. Uh, you look behind you, you've got, you've got the armies, uh, the Egyptian armies coming after you. You, you say, I look, I look in front of me and I'm distressed. I look behind me, I'm depressed. Uh, someone said, got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things that are impossible. I've got good news for you. If you're between a rock and a hard place tonight, if you're in a, in a difficult, no-win, impossible situation, look to the Red Sea. Look to the Red Sea. Look no further than this story right here and, and notice what real faith, biblical faith, can do for you. Now, the children of Israel did not have a lot of faith. They did not have a whole lot of faith to begin with. Moses was the one who had the faith. Moses. In, in fact, you, you read the text. We won't read it specifically, but boy, they blessed Moses out. They're upset with Moses. They said, man, what in the world did you bring us down here for? Did you bring us down here so we could all drown? Matter of fact, I think it's verse 10. The Bible says they're, they're angry. They're sore afraid. They, they, they jump on Moses in verse 11. And that's what they always did when they found themselves in a tough spot. Uh, it says in verse 12, they said, look, it'd be better for us to, to just spend the rest of our lives as slaves serving the Egyptians than to die in this wilderness. But I want you to see how faith can take one man, how real faith can take one man and lift the level of faith for a whole bunch of people. Uh, fear is contagious, one man said, but I'm here to tell you, faith is contagious as well. One person's fear can, can make a whole crowd of people afraid, but, but one person's faith can make a whole crowd of people faithful, faithful people, full of faith. Notice in Exodus 14, 13, it says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. Verse 14, The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Now here's what happened. When they start moving to, uh, 
uh, forward toward the Red Sea by faith. God took that Red Sea and he parted the waters. That ain't all he did. Then he took his vacuum cleaners there and he just sucked up all that water out of the sand and, and, and it was dry as dust. And they walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. That's what faith does. That's what faith does for you. Faith leads you through waters of impossibility. Uh, the, the, the parting of the waters of the Red Sea, uh, really it's a picture of the, of, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and, and can I remind you of our definition of faith? It's trusting what God says, acting on it, regardless of circumstances and consequences. Is that not beautifully illustrated right here? The children of Israel went through, of course you know the story, on dry ground. The Egyptians come, they see the waters parted, they see the last few uh, Israelites uh, walking through, and they say, look, if they could do it, let's try it too. And Hebrews says that they were drowned trying to go through. The very same water that delivered the Israelites destroyed Egypt. The same water. I like what one writer, Wearsby, said. He said, it all boils down to this. Which death are you going to depend on for your salvation? Are you going to depend on your own death for your salvation? Or are you going to depend upon the death of Jesus Christ? Faith brings us out. Faith brings us through. And notice in verse 30, we come to the third illustration. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, it says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. So the writer of Hebrews is going to fast forward about 40 years. He's going to send us about 40 years ahead, and he, he's going to bypass the wilderness experience. Um, he's going to move through the, the book of Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's going to go into the book of Joshua. And, and he's going to take us to Joshua chapter 6. Um, it's the experience of the children of Israel in Jericho. What in the world can we learn about faith at Jericho? Well, we learn that faith literally brings us in. They're going to get brought into Jericho, conquer that city by faith. Now, what, a, what an obstacle Jericho was. Um, a huge obstacle. As they got ready to go into the land that God had, had promised them, the promised land, the, the first thing they meet is Jericho. The walls of Jericho were, were so... Uh, impendable, impending. It was seemingly impregnable. They were so wide that uh, Bible scholars, historians tell us that, that uh, you could take two chariots and run them side by side on top of the walls. They were that big. Um, the children of Israel look at the city of, of Jericho and they're probably thinking, what an impossibility. Well, God had a plan. God had a plan for those walls to come down. Now, I can imagine, Joshua, by the way, Joshua is now the leader, Moses is dead. And isn't it true in life that God's, God's workers, they come and go, but God's work just keeps going on. Uh, you're not going to stop God's work. Uh, men come, men go, but God's, God's work does not. Uh, God says to Joshua, Joshua, i got a plan to get the children of Israel um, victory in Jericho, you're going to conquer Jericho, that city, that great city. Well, Joshua is a general. I'm sure his, his head starts spinning at that point. He's thinking, he's, he's thinking how this can be done. He, he's probably um, battle planning, game planning, and thoughts are going through his mind. He thought, boy, the Lord probably wants us to, get, somebody go get all the battering rams. We're going to need all of them. We need to, so y'all start piling up rocks and stones and things like this. That we're, we're going to need it. Lord, I'm getting ready. Lord, what's the plan? And God says, oh, i got a better plan than that. Okay, Lord, good. I'm all ears. What is it? He said, for six days, I want you to get you some soldiers. And get you some priests, seven of them with ram's horns. They call it shofars. Um, get the Ark of the Covenant. Don't forget that, Joshua. Get the Ark of the Covenant. Put it on the shoulders of some more priests. Then get you uh, the rest of your people and, and, and a rear guard of soldiers behind them. And I want you to just walk around that city of Jericho one time. Silently, Don't let the people say a word. Every now and then along the way, the, the priest can blow on that shofar. And Joshua probably said, Lord, what are you talking about? Come again. What do you want us to do? Just, just for six days, Joshua, just get your procession and just walk around that wall. God, you sure? I'm sure. 
Well, what's faith? Faith is trusting what God says, acting upon it regardless of circumstances, regardless of consequences. And so, first day comes, the people are uh, on the walls of Jericho, I'm sure, looking down at the children of Israel, and they're probably thinking these, these people, they're crazy, but they're going to attack any moment. And they're watching them. And one man says, well, what are they doing? Well, all they're doing is walking, and every now and then one of them will blow that shofar. Then they go back to their tents. Second day comes, same thing. About the third day, the people of Jericho were probably having a big time with the children of Israel, a bunch of, bunch of idiots, a bunch of goofballs. They're crazy. Can't you hear them? They're probably making joke after joke. You know, how many Israelites does it take to install a light bulb and things like this? They're coming up with all kinds of jokes for the Israelites. They, they look like a bunch of idiots. And they do that for six days. Then on the seventh day, God says, all right, Joshua, here's the game plan. Well done. You've obeyed well. Here's what we're going to do this time. And Joshua's probably thinking, all right, here comes the fighting. Let's get ready for war. And God says, no, I've got a better plan. He says, I want you to go around the city seven times, seven times today. He said, for the first six times, you don't say a thing. Complete silence. Be absolutely silent. But the seventh time you go around the city, blow those trumpets, and the people need to shout. March forward. And when they shout and march forward, of course, you know the Bible. The Bible says that the walls of Jericho fell flat. They walk in, and they take the city. Uh, I'm going to sort of leave this message open-ended tonight because we're going to pick, pick back up, hitch right here next Wednesday night. But I wonder, do you have any Jerichos in your life? Any Jerichos? You look at it and you say, there's no way that I can conquer this battle. No way. It's impregnable. It's, it's too big. It's too strong. Uh, and it could be anything. It could be anything. It, it, it could be a deeply entrenched habit, addiction. Um, it could be a hobby. That's not, not helping your walk with the Lord. Maybe it's not a bad thing in and of itself, but, but you're devoting too much time to it, too much energy to it, and it's, it's pulling you away from God. Um, it could be some friends who are poisoning your life. Um, I, you know, it, it could be a number of things. It could be a job. It, it could be somebody dragging you down. Uh, it's Jericho. It's Jericho. Maybe it's a weakness in your personality and, and it's constantly, the devil is constantly, he knows you've got that weakness, and he is bringing up situations and circumstances that really magnify that, and, and it's defeating you on a constant basis. And you're tired of it. You're defeated. It's a Jericho in your life. What do I do? Well, read Joshua 6. Read Joshua 6. You say, Pastor, I don't get much help out of that. I can't walk around my Jericho. I don't have a shofar. And these walls aren't going to tumble down in that, in that sense. Well, if you've got a Jericho in your life, it wasn't the walking around. It wasn't the blowing of a shofar. It wasn't the shouting that made those walls crumble. It was faith. It was faith. It was faith. They took God's word. They acted upon it. They obeyed it. Regardless of how silly it made them look, regardless of how crazy it sounded to them, Adrian Rogers used to say, just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. Faith. Faith comes in. You're going to defeat your Jerichos. You're going to cross your Red Sea by faith. By faith. By faith. We'll pick back up. We'll hitch right there next Wednesday night. Let's stand to our feet. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Thank you for your time, your attention this evening. I hope, hope you've been blessed by the reading and the teaching of God's Word tonight. Uh, grab one of these if you don't have it or you've lost yours or misplaced it. Um, and pray for Jim Showers. Jim Showers tonight, all right? Uh, tomorrow when you wake up, praying for Andrew Martin's uh, cousin, Jonathan Lott. Jonathan Lott. Pray for uh, Jonathan Lott in Peru. All right. And if you're praying for Jonathan, I think David's not on there, but you might as well pray for David Lott because they're working together as well, his father. So... The Lot family, we should say. Amen. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer tonight. Um, let me give you a prayer request before we do. Uh, Candy Perez texted me today, and her little boy, I think it was Isaiah. Uh, is that right, Lord? 
I think that's right. It is Isaiah. Okay, he had surgery today, and, um, and everything went well. He recovered well. Um, but but you pray for pray for them. I told her I would mention that tonight. Uh, and then I don't see Miss Nancy Kirkland here tonight, but pray for for Charlie. Uh, he's still hanging on, Brian. As far as you know, okay. He but Charlie's Charlie's in the last days of his life. He's uh, he's looking for a good place to cross. All right. So pray for pray for Miss Nancy Kirkland and Brother Charlie Kirkland. All right. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer, and we'll look forward to worship on Sunday again. Brother Jimmy Adams is preaching on Sunday, and uh, you'll you'll want to be here for that. He, Jimmy's a great, great preacher of God's word. Bobby, do say, pray for us if you will.